We're glad to have everyone here this evening. Uh, I am Keith Sharp, and I am the moderator for Bruce Reeves, who is representing the Highway 65 North Church of Christ in this uh, series of public debates. Uh, the first two nights of the debate were held uh, at the uh, in North Little Rock at the United Pentecostal Church there. And uh, the first two nights were on the subject of the Godhead. I'm not going to go over those propositions. The last two nights of the debate will be on the subject of the baptismal formula. Uh, and uh, because Mr. Weatherly will be in the affirmative tonight, his moderator... Uh, Mr. John Carroll will be in charge of the proceedings, and so this will be the last time you have to look at my face, for which you can give thanks. Uh, but uh, just a few announcements, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. John Carroll. And first is there are there will be DVDs available. Uh, <laughs> I'm an old enough guy; it just amazes me these announcements I'm able to make now. <laughs> there will be DVDs available of this debate, free. Uh, and there is a place out in the foyer where you can sign up if you'd like to receive a DVD of the debate uh, and let them know you'd like to receive that. Uh, there are restrooms. If you go out into the foyer and turn to the left, there's restrooms, and uh, so those are there for uh, you. And really that's all that I think I have to say except that uh, Mr. Uh, Reeves, Mr. Bruce Reeves, is representing the Highway 65 North Church of Christ. It is my privilege to be working with him as his moderator. And now I'll turn it over to Mr. John Carroll, who is moderating for Mr. Jason Weatherly. Uh, and since Mr. Weatherly is in the affirmative tonight, Mr. Carroll, you're in charge. I would like to say it's also an honor to be with you this evening to have the opportunity to discuss the propositions that are at hand for this debate this evening. And uh, we appreciate all of you that have come out to listen and uh, those of you that were at the Pentecostal Assembly the first two nights that are here tonight. We appreciate your return. And for those of you that are attending the discussion for the first evening, we are equally appreciative to have you here with us uh, in the debate for tonight. And uh, it has been a privilege of mine to be able to moderate and uh, be uh, moderating on the behalf of Brother Weatherly. And I would also like to say that it has been a privilege uh, to work with my counterpart, Mr. Keith Sharp. And uh, they have been very gentlemanly throughout the course of this discussion. And uh, we appreciate that very much. And uh, just like the first two nights, tonight as well, uh, we ask that uh, the people be reverent to the speakers, that there be no interruptions of any kind. Um, did you already mention the cell phone thing? Someone's cell phone went off just, to, just as he was coming up. So if you haven't turned it off yet, we would appreciate uh, we making sure that our cell phones are at least on vibrate. And uh, that way that we're not disrupted during a speech of one of the debaters. And while I'm saying that, as I return to my seat, I am going to make sure that mine is either on silent, vibrate, or turned off. Because it would not be very good uh, for the rule maker to be having his cell phone go off a little later in the discussion. So I'm going to uh, make sure that happens as well. Amen. I think both of the debaters have done an excellent job from their respective positions. They put a lot of hard work and study into the debates, and uh, we are excited about um, the proposition this evening. Before we go forward into allowing uh, Brother Weatherly to come and give his first affirmative speech, we're going to ask the pastor of the Parishing United Pentecostal Church, the host of the first two nights of the debate, to come at this time and open with prayer. Can the cameraman hear me in the back? Great. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be before you tonight to present to you what I believe to be the truth of God's Word. I'm thankful for each and every one of you for taking the time to join us in this Bible discussion tonight. The proposition states the Scriptures teach that in order for baptism to be valid, the name of Jesus must be orally invoked 
by the baptizer. Now, by way of definition, when I say the Scriptures, I mean the 66 books of the Bible. By teach, I mean they instruct or they impart knowledge. In order for means with a result to. Baptism is immersion in water. Valid means that it is binding or lawful. The name of Jesus is the name of the Lord, Acts 9 and 5. Must be means that it is essential. It is not an option. Orally invoked means verbally pronounced. And by the baptizer, I mean the administrator of baptism. Now, as Mr. Reeves and I have agreed, I'd like to answer the questions he has asked me before the debate. Question number one. Is the one baptism of Ephesians 4 and 5 water baptism into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Number two, do you agree with me that healing was always done in the name of Jesus? No, not specifically. However, elders are admonished to anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord, James 5.14. Number three, do you believe that it is a sin for the baptizer to only say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? It is not a sin to quote Scripture. However, simply quoting the Scripture does not make the baptism valid. Number four, do you deny that the phrase in the name of can mean by the authority? The phrase in the name of does not mean by the authority. Number five, do you deny that one can do something by the authority of Jesus without orally pronouncing the designation? No, I do not deny that. However, if the name is not pronounced, then it was not done in the name of Jesus. Chart number three. Before we get into our affirmative uh, arguments, we'd like to establish what the real issue of this debate is tonight. The issue tonight is not immersion. Romans 6, 3 through 4, buried with him in baptism. Bruce and I agree that baptism is by immersion. The issue tonight is not whether or not baptism saves us. 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure whereunto baptism does also now save us. Bruce and I agree that baptism is essential to our salvation. The issue tonight is not the remission of sins. Acts 22.16, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Bruce and I agree that baptism is for the purpose of washing away or the remission of sins. The issue tonight is not, must we baptize in the name of Jesus? Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Bruce and I agree that we must baptize in the name of Jesus. Now, what is the issue? The issue is, what does that phrase, in the name of, mean? Now, as far as I understand, Bruce affirms that to baptize in the name of Jesus means to baptize by the authority of Jesus with no verbal reference to His name. Whereas I affirm that to baptize in the name of Jesus means to baptize while naming, calling out, or calling upon the name of Jesus. My chart number five. We want to first establish that in the name of does not mean by the authority. Leviticus 19.12 states, And you shall not swear falsely in my name, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. In my name cannot mean by my authority. Otherwise, the Lord would be saying, You shall not swear falsely by my authority, which would be nonsensical. So clearly, in my name cannot mean by my authority. Jeremiah 14.14 14. The Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. In my name cannot mean by my authority, because the Lord cannot lie. Or The Lord said that He did not send them, He did not command them, He did not speak unto them. Therefore, they did not have His authority, but they said that He did it in His name. Therefore, in my name cannot mean by my authority. Jeremiah 29:23 because they have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken lying words in my name which I have not commanded them. Now notice the Lord said that they spoke lying words. How did they speak lying words? In my name. Now it doesn't say that they pretended to speak lying words in his name. The Lord said they have spoken lying words in my name. So in my name cannot mean by my authority, for God cannot lie and He will not authorize a lie. Thus, in my name cannot mean by my authority. Micah 4 and 5. For all people will walk everyone in the name of His God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. 
in my or in the name of cannot mean by the authority of these false gods. Paul said an idol is nothing. And since these false gods do not exist, they do not have authority. Thus, in the name of cannot mean by the authority. Zechariah 13.3 For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. Again, the phrase in the name of cannot mean by the authority of. Otherwise, they would be saying thou speakest lies by the authority of the Lord. Therefore, we conclude that in the name of does not mean by the authority. Chart number 10. We want to look at a consistent use of the phrase in the name of to show you that in the name of means to orally pronounce the name. Now, first, we want to look at some Old Testament passages. Deuteronomy 25 and 6 says, And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Now, this is not referring to the authority of the dead brother, but to his orally spoken name. In the Old Testament, if a man passed away and did not have a son, his brother would go unto the widow, and when she conceived a son, that firstborn which was born would succeed in the name, in the orally orally spoken name of that brother so that his orally spoken name would not be put out of Israel. Judges 18.29 says, And they called the name of the city Dan in the name of Dan their father. Now this isn't referring to the authority of Dan because Dan had been dead for many years. Rather, it is referring to the orally spoken name of Dan. 1 Samuel 20.42 And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for as much as we have sworn both of us In the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee. Notice that when Jonathan and David swore in the name of the Lord, the name Lord was actually pronounced. 1 Samuel 25, 9-10 And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words, In the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? Now, it's obvious from the context that the phrase in the name of David means that they orally pronounce the name David. Otherwise, why would Nabal say, who is David? If the name David was not invoked, how would Nabal have known whose servants they were or that David was the son of Jesse? Thus, the phrase in the name of means to orally pronounce the name. 1 Kings 18.26 And they took the young bull which he gave them, and they offered it and called in the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. When they called in the name of Baal, they actually orally pronounced the name Baal. The New English translation states they invoked the name Baal. Thus, we can see from a consistent use of the phrase in the name of in the Old Testament that the phrase in the name of means to orally pronounce the name. Chart number 11. Now I want to show you from the Hebrew lexicons and dictionaries and how they define the phrase in the name of. Kohler and Baumgartner, Hebrew and Aramaic Lexicon, Volume 2, page 983, says, Calling the name equals in the name of. Brown Driver Briggs, Hebrew English Lexicon, page 1028, says, In the name of, to call with, that is, use the name in worship. New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, page 412, says the Hebrew expression in the name occurs frequently in the Old Testament. The phrase appears most often in association with the name Yahweh, with the primary meaning of calling on Yahweh by His name, worshiping Him. Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, volume 5, page 261, says, Thus the formula in the name often signifies mention or utterance of the name Yahweh. Chart number 12. A consistent use of the phrase in the name of in the New Testament also shows that in the name of means calling the name. Luke 9.49 says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followed not with us. Now, how did John know that this stranger was casting out devils in Jesus' name if the name was not invoked? John's statement is not a statement of authority. John did not feel that this stranger was authorized to cast out demons, and thus he forbid him. Therefore, the phrase, in thy name, must refer to the orally pronouncing of the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 9, verse 37 says, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. Bowerart Gingrich Danker Lexicon, 
page 573, translates this, Receive a child when my name is confessed. Acts 528, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Now, how would they know what name they taught in if the name was not orally pronounced? James 514, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Bauer, Gingrich, Danker, Lexicon, page 572, translates this, The elders are to anoint the sick with oil while calling on the name of the Lord. Acts, Acts 9.27 But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. This refers to Saul of Tarsus actually orally pronouncing the name of Jesus. John 15.16 That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it to you. This refers to us orally pronouncing the name of Jesus in our prayers. Matthew 18 and 20 for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Balrog, Gingrich, Danker, Lexicon, page 572, translates this. Two or three gather together while naming or calling on my name. Thus, from a consistent use in the New Testament, we see that the phrase in the name of means to orally pronounce the name. Chart number 13. Acts 2.38 states, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, Bruce and I agree, based upon this passage, we must baptize in the name of Jesus. But what does that phrase, in the name of, mean? Acts 2.38 uses the Greek preposition, epa, or upon the name. Bauer, Gingrich, Danker, Lexicon, page 288 states, The formula, upon the name of, used with many verbs, probably means in connection with, or by the use of, naming, calling out, calling upon the name. Baptizian, Acts 2.38. Bauer, Gingrich, Danker, Lexicon, page 573. Upon the name of, when someone's name is mentioned or called upon, mentioning someone's name. Acts 2. 38. F.F. Bruce, Acts, page 98, states, The baptism indeed was doubly associated with the name of Jesus Christ, as the baptizer also named it over the person baptized. Ernest Hankin, commentary on Acts, page 184, says, Luke presupposes the form of baptism practice in his own community. The name Jesus Christ is pronounced over the candidate. Jackson and Lake, The Beginnings of Christianity, Volume 5, page 124 says, A convert knew perfectly well when he said that he had been baptized in the name of Jesus. He meant someone had said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus or something similar. Now, the Anchor Bible translates the phrase in the name of Jesus as calling upon the name of Jesus Christ. If we understand that the word baptized is in the passive voice, it means be baptized by another. That is, be baptized by the baptizer. So the full force of Acts 2.38 is be baptized by the baptizer calling upon the name of Jesus Christ. Chart number 15. In Acts 10.48, Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the phrase, in the name of, in this passage, in Greek, is into onama. Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, Volume 1, page 436 says, The Greek phrase, in the name of, means the acts of baptism take place with utterance of the name of Jesus. Bauer, English Danker Lexicon, page 572 says, in the name of God or Jesus means in the majority of the cases with mention of the name while naming or calling on the name. In many passages, it seems to be a formula. Be baptized or have oneself baptized while naming the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38 and 10.48. Kittle's Theological Dictionary, the New Testament, volume 5, page 271 says, the most general meaning of in the name of is with invocation of. Wilhelm Heidemuller, in Nomen of 1903, page 127 says, The phrase baptize in and ep of the name gives a description of the process of baptism. They indicate that the baptism took place during the naming of the name 
of Jesus. Chart number 16. In Acts chapter 8, verse 16 and 19 and 5, the Bible states that those converts were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, the phrase in the name of in these verses is Ice to Onama. Ballard Gingrich Danker Lexicon, page 572, states that Ice to Onama is a formula of Hellenistic legal commercial language. Ice to Onama Tinos, to the name equals to the account over which the name stands. Through baptism into the name, the one who is baptized becomes the possession of and comes under the protection of the one whose name he bears. He is under the control of the effective power of the name and the one who bears the name. He is dedicated to them. An additional factor to a degree may be the sense of into the name equals with mention of the name. Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Volume 1, pages 539 through 540 states, The distinctive feature of Christian baptism is that it is administered into the name of Christ. The formula into the name seems rather to have been a technical term in Hellenistic commerce to the account. In both cases, the use of the phrase is understandable since the account bears the name of the one who owns it. And in baptism, the name of Christ is pronounced, invoked, and confessed by the one who baptizes. Joseph Thayer's lexicon, page 94, under the word baptizo, says to baptize into the name of means to profess the name of one whose followers we become. Chart number 19. In Acts 22.16, Saul of Tarsus was commanded, And now, why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now the words baptize, wash, and call in this verse are in the causative middle voice. Causative middle in Greek means to get something done to you. These were all things Saul would get done to him. So notice, the word baptize in the causative middle means to get baptized, not go baptized. Saul was commanded to get baptized. The word wash in the cause of middle means get your sins washed away, not go wash away sins. Saul was commanded to get his sins washed away. Now, if baptize and wash in the causative middle mean get yourself baptized and get your sins washed away, then to be consistent, the word call in the causative middle must mean get called upon you His name. Thus, the full force of Acts 22.16 would be get yourself baptized and get His name called upon you. Get yourself baptized. Get your sins washed away. Get called upon you His name, showing that the baptizer called the name of Jesus over the one baptized. My chart number 20. Now, even my opponent and his fellow brethren understand that the causative middle in Acts 22.16 refers to things that Saul would get done to him. Notice here I have a copy of Pat Donahue's Baptism Purpose Chart, number 43. Pat is one of Bruce's non-institutional brethren and a fellow debater. I've had the privilege of debating Pat several times, and Mr. Sharp is a good friend of Pat Donahue. Now, Pat quotes a couple of grammars here towards the meaning of the middle voice, and he says, Middle voice? Certainly. The meaning of Acts 22.16 would be, Arise and get yourself baptized. Get your sins washed away. Now, if the words baptize and wash in the causative middle voice mean get yourself baptized and get your sins washed away, then the word call in the same voice, the same verse, the same context must mean get called upon you His name. Chart number 30. What's my time? In Acts 15, 14, the Apostle James said that the conversion of the Gentiles was God calling out of the Gentiles a people for His name. Now, in defense of the conversion of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, James appealed to an Old Testament prophecy which states that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord. Now, James echoes this phrase in James 2 and 7, which states, Do they not slander that good name which was called upon you? The word called in Acts 15, 17, which is in the perfect tense, 
indicates that this was not a habitual calling, such as the name Christian. Otherwise, the imperfect tense would have been used. This word call refers to the orally pronounced name of Jesus being called upon them. Bauer at Gingrich Danker Lexicon, page 288 states, Of persons over which something is done, speak the name of Jesus over someone. Acts 15, 17 and James 2 and 7. These passages indicate that the Gentiles had the name of the Lord called upon them in their conversion. Now, where in the conversion of the Gentiles is the name of the Lord mentioned? Acts 10, 48, at their baptism. And He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And the name of the Lord is Jesus. Acts 9 and 5, the Lord said, I am Jesus. Therefore, these passages indicate that the name of Jesus was called upon the believer in baptism. The Amplified Bible even translates James 2 and 7 as, Is it not they who slander and blaspheme that precious name by the which you are distinguished and called the name of Christ invoked in baptism? Chart number 32. Even your own Church of Christ scholars understand that James 2 and 7 refers to the name of Jesus being called over the candidate in baptism. Dr. Diane Woods, who was one of your champion Church of Christ debaters, said, "...is literally which is called upon you." The verb called is from the Greek word epikaleo, aorist passive participle, and signifies to assign a name to, to place a name upon, the name was most surely that of Christ pronounced upon us in baptism. James Burton Kaufman, who has written commentary on the entire Bible, says, The obvious reference here is to the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of whom all Christians were baptized, Acts 2.38, and upon whom the name was formally declared, as in the baptismal formula. A plumber commented that the last clause literally means which was called upon you. And we need not doubt that the reference is to the name of Christ which was invoked upon them at their baptism. J.W. Roberts, who is one of your institutional brethren who wrote for Firm Foundation Publications, said, In the view of this background, the probability is that the reference is to the invocation of the name of Jesus Christ upon the believer at baptism. Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ. From this, it is very unlikely that the reference is to the derogatory use of the name Christian. Chart number 34. So in conclusion, in our first affirmative, we want to quickly restate our affirmative proofs. We've shown you from the Scriptures that the phrase, in the name of, does not mean by the authority. We've shown you from a consistent use of both the Old and the New Testament that the phrase, in the name of, means calling or pronouncing the name. We've shown you from the Hebrew lexicons that the phrase, in the name of, means calling the name. We've shown you from the Greek lexicons and scholars that the phrase in the name of means naming, calling out, or calling upon the name. We've shown you from the Scriptures that believers had the name of the Lord called upon them. Thus, in order for baptism to be valid, the name of Jesus must be orally invoked by the baptizer. I thank you for your time. It is my blessing to be with you this evening. I certainly would feel remiss if I did not express appreciation and follow suit in thanking you for being here. I know many of you are very busy, but see the importance of studying the Word of God. And I'm enjoying very much the opportunity to study with you and study with my opponent uh, this evening as well. The proposition is before you. It's been read in your hearing. It is very simple. The Scriptures teach that in order for baptism to be valid... The name of Jesus must be orally invoked by the baptizer. Now, I want you to notice, really, the weighty responsibility that Mr. Weatherly has this evening. And I don't believe he's met that responsibility at all. Notice that he is saying, chart number four, the name of Jesus, and he's describing that as the designation Jesus, must, and notice that word must, must, be orally invoked. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't even just say it must be orally invoked by someone. He says the name of Jesus must be orally invoked by the baptizer. 
Now let that sink into your mind this evening. Even if you have someone who's penitent, who confesses Jesus, even if they said Jesus before they were baptized, and then said Jesus after they were baptized. If the, if the baptizer does not say Jesus over them, then they are not truly converted. And we've noticed these terms together. I want you to understand the requirement of a must proposition. Now, just generally speaking, any time you have a must proposition, you have a burden on you, and you must meet that burden from a religious standpoint, improving it from the Scriptures. Mr. Weatherly has a burden of proof, and we really haven't seen it. Now, he's read from a, a lot of scholars. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. The most important thing, and the final authority, is what do the Scriptures teach? What does the Word of God say? He must show this evening, and he hasn't done it so far, but he must show 100% consistency in every single example of conversion in the Word of God. In every single one, he must find passages stating what the preacher said. Now, you remember that when he gets back up here in a little bit. He has to show us passages where the preacher said this, or the baptizer, I should say. Go back. I'm not done. When baptizing someone, and said statement can be demonstrated as being consistent in every case. Again, now just let this sink in. He must show 100% agreement between specific statements and every example. All right, now, Don, you can move. Number six, all that is required of me tonight. This is the only requirement that I have tonight. All that is required of the negative is to find one passage, ladies and gentlemen. That's all I have to find. One passage demonstrating the inconsistency of my opponent's position. Let's move on. To number 11. Now, I want to explain to you what I'm not denying very quickly. I'm not denying, and I appreciate, Jason, you saying this. I'm not denying that one must be baptized in the name of Jesus. And Mr. Weatherly's right. The issue is, what does that mean? What's the definition of that? I'm not denying that salvation is in Jesus Christ. I'm not denying that one must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you were at the debate on Monday and Tuesday, you would know I believe that with all of my heart. Here's what we are denying. That there is a uniform verbal formula which must, that word must, be pronounced by the baptizer. Now, that's what he has to prove in order for the baptism to be valid. Number 15. Now, the word name or the idea of name in the Scripture has some different definitions. To get up here and act like that, that word always means the same thing, that's just not so. You know, sometimes it does mean a designation. I'm not denying that. But sometimes it's talking about our reputation. Proverbs 22.1. And sometimes it is talking about authority. Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Sometimes it's talking about one's person. It represents all of the person. I want to get to Mr. Weatherly's questions. He asked me, in Luke 9.49, how did John know that the disciple cast out demons in Jesus' name? Why did John forbid him? Well, the text doesn't say that they heard Jesus. Now, that's what he's got to prove there, that they heard Jesus. The text doesn't say that. He asked me, John the Baptist baptized, A, in the name of John, B, in the name of Jesus, C, by the authority of John, D, by the authority of Jesus. Well, if you'll read John 133, the Father sent him to baptize. In Deuteronomy 25 and verse 6, does the firstborn succeed by the authority of the dead brother, or does this refer to the orally spoken name? Now, Mr. Weatherly named there stands, it's, it's not just an appellative, name stands for his lineage and all that that would represent. He asked me, number four, true or false, Joseph Thayer's lexicon does mention orally invoking the name as a designation of in the name. Now, write this down, and I know you're taking good notes, but write this down. He does not use it in the sense you're using it in this question in reference to baptism. And that's what you must prove. 
Number five, does Colossians 3.17 require us to give thanks unto God with every word or deed that we do? For example, every time a father hits an L at work, or every time a mother makes lunch, or every time a son takes out the garbage, must they give thanks to God? Whatever, the word whatever in that context, and we're going to look at Colossians 3.17, but the term whatever does not modify thanks. You'll notice there's two clauses in that sentence. You have giving of the thanks, and then you have whatever you do. Whatever you do must be in the name of Jesus. Whatever does not modify the second clause, but it modifies the first clause. Now, I want to deal with something that's going on. And the reason I want to deal with it tonight is we've seen it again tonight, but it's not the first time we've seen it. We've seen it tonight, Mr. Weatherly, has misquoted several of these sources. He's threw all those sources at you. But he's misquoted his sources on several occasions. Now, I see an example of that on his question number four, which we'll get to in a moment, regarding Mr. Thayer and this issue. I'm going to give you several examples of that. But this isn't the first time. We saw that Monday and Tuesday. Now, I will tell you, and I mean this in all love, But that's one of the characteristics. That's the M.O. of a false teacher. Is he misquotes his sources. He misrepresents his sources. Now, we've seen a pattern. And Mr. Weatherly, he's been doing the same thing tonight that he's been doing all week. And I will tell you, if he treats Scripture like he treats some of the scholars that he cites, I think I understand why he is in error. Now, Mr. Weatherly, here's the deal. I've got a stack of books right there. And so if you question anything that we're about to demonstrate, you need to go get that book, open that thing up tonight, and prove me wrong in your misrepresentation of these things. On Tuesday night, we, to give you an example, heard from John 10.30, I and my Father are one. And we heard this term, heist or haste, regarding one, demands one person. And we heard about several sources. So you know what we did? I listened attentively. We went and got the sources, and we checked them out. He cited Arden and Gingrich. But you know, Arden and Gingrich don't say that it's just one person. It doesn't say uh, haste is, is only used as a numerical singularity. In fact, it references many passages where haste is used as a united plurality. In fact, it cites... Now, get your Bible out, all of you, get it out. We're about to look at some passages. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 is cited by Arden and Gingrich. Now, Mr. Weatherly, you cited this and said it demands a numerical singularity of person. But you know, Arden and Gingrich cite 1 Corinthians 10, 17, for we being many are one bread and one body. That doesn't prove your point. Now, the point this evening is not so much the topic, but dealing with these sources this way. Let's move on. 203, he did the same thing on Thayer. He talks about Thayer and and Hase. Well, I went and checked Thayer out. And Thayer says, in opposed, and he's defining the term there in John 10, 30, in opposed to a division and departs and in ethical matters to dissension. So he's talking about unity here. That's what I said. Unity. John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. He cites Romans 12, 4, 1 Corinthians 12, John 17, 11, And John 17, 21 through 23. You know, Mr. Weather, you didn't cite vines, though. Why didn't you cite vines? I'd kind of like to know why you didn't cite vines. You know, selective citing to find what you think you can make sound like it supports you. That's not a good thing. Vines on the term said metaphorically union and concord. John 10, 30. John 11, 52. John 17, 11. And Philippians 1, 27. He went to poor old Brother Kaufman on Tuesday. And he talked about Brother Kaufman. And he cited, here it is, 205, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And completely missed the point. The quote says, The inconsistency in supposing that Elijah's Lord would call upon him for aid only indicates the utter failure of the Pharisees to see in Christ the true Son of God. The him there is Elijah. It's not that it was strange for him to call on God. Just look at that. Supposing that Elijah is Lord would call upon him Elijah. Now, we went to A.T. Robertson. 
And he talks about one over here. And he says, not one person. Not one person. Misrepresented that, but one essence or nature. Now, you know, you look at these passages. Philippians 1.27, Luke 14.18, John 10.30, John 17, Acts 4.32, one heart and one soul. Romans 12.4 is talking about unity. And by the way, we cited 1 Corinthians 3.8. I don't know if you didn't know that was the original term there or what. Now, the final authority is the Bible, but you're misusing these folks. And you did it again tonight. 91. You did it again. You know what you did. You did this one time before. And I thought you might do it again. I was hoping you wouldn't, but you did it again. Now, here's 32. Here's 32. Now, this is a pattern. This is a pattern that we've... Established. Look up here, Dr. Guy in Woods, remember? And he read this quote, is literally, which is called upon you. The verb called is from the Greek word epikaleo. And he goes on, and he just kind of stops there. This name was most surely that of Christ pronounced upon us in baptism. Mr. Weatherly, I've got a copy of this chart. I need you to read the last sentence when you get back up here. This is a misrepresentation. Now, I want you to see this. He quotes. I want you to look over here. See this? See this? He stops quoting. He stops quoting. Why didn't he give us the last sentence? Because, by the way, Guy and Woods debated the one of the Pentecostals on this point. He sure didn't agree with them. He's talking about the name Christian. See that? And which Christians gladly wear because given by divine authority. Why, why, didn't, why didn't we see that quote? I wonder why that didn't happen. All right. 16. Let's talk about Thayer a little bit and what this phrase means. Mr. Thayer, you asked me about this, about Thayer. Well, on baptism, he agrees with my position. That is, in the name of me is by the authority of. He says, the name that is for one's rank, authority, interest, pleasure, command, excellencies. Number 20, vines. Mentions in recognition of authority. He said, oh, it couldn't be authority. Did you hear him say that? It, it's not. It's not authority, he said. That's not what Mr. Vine says. Thayer. Now, by the way, these are the baptism passages we're talking about tonight. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 19.5, Acts 10.48. Here's what Mr. Thayer says. Upon or epi, the name of Christ, to do anything relying upon the name that is the authority of anyone. Wonder why we didn't see that one tonight. Acts 8, 16 and 19, 5. In Acts, the name of the Lord, to do a thing by one's command and authority, acting on his behalf, promoting his cause. Acts 10, 48. In the name of the Lord, to do a thing of Jesus, of his own free will and authority. Number 23. I want to show you this. Yeah, B talks about in the use of the name of Christ, the power of his name being invoked, etc. But here's by the command and authority of Christ. See just above. That's what I just showed you. Thayer says when we're talking about those baptism passages, it's by the authority of. Now we're going to move a little bit. Turn on to 106. Turn your Bible to Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Colossians 3 says, Whatever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord. Now, does that mean we have to say Jesus? No. The point is that everything I do in my life as a Christian must be authorized by the Word of God, must be authorized by the Lord. In fact, you have to at least look at the immediate context. And the immediate context mentions moral conduct. Does that mean my moral conduct's not in the name of Jesus unless I say Jesus? Or does it mean my moral conduct must be authorized by God? My relationship with other Christians, my family relationships, my work ethic. Does that mean I can't have a work ethic authorized or in the name of Jesus? Now, Mr. Weatherly, this is what you said. You said something similar tonight, and I think we've got a problem here. 107. Let's listen. Let's listen to Mr. Weatherly. And before you do, he was asked this question. By the way, Brother Donahue is a friend of mine. He's a friend of Brother Sharps. He's a brother, and he's even debated him. We love each other. Sometimes we debate each other, if you guys haven't figured it out. So that, that doesn't sway me one way or the other. Okay, 107. Let's listen to this quotation. Listen very closely. 
What's the name of Jesus? Well, Jesus' name will go forward every time that a healing took place in the New Testament. The answer is no. For example, the raising of Lazarus, the name of Jesus was not invoked. Like the raising of Dorcas, the name of Jesus was not invoked. So we have a figure that's about as sick as you can get as if you're dead. You have a resurrection, and Mr. Weatherly admits that we have a resurrection and that the name of Jesus was not invoked. And you've got a couple of options. Go to the next chart. Don, go to... Uh, by the way, can we put baptism in that quote? Would that be all right? Can we put baptism? Was the name of Jesus... Was Jesus' name invoked orally every time that a baptism took place in the New Testament? The answer is no! Because that's not what it means. It means by the authority of if it works here, why doesn't it work over there? You've got a problem on your pattern right here, by the way. Number eight. Number eight. Now, isn't that what Mr. Weatherly said? I want to make sure that's what Mr. Weatherly said. Let's make sure it's what Mr. Weatherly said. That's what he said. He said at the raising of Dorcas, the name of Jesus was not. He didn't say we just can't read about it. He said it was not invoked. Now, you know, when you turn your Bible over to Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, the Lord said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Now, now here's, the, here's the deal, Mr. Weatherly. Either you're going to have to say, Peter raised Dorcas in the name of Jesus without orally invoking the designation Jesus. And if that's what you say, I'm going to tell you we can shake hands on this, and I'll say I agree with you. Mark 16, 17 says they did it in the name of Jesus, but you've admitted the name of Jesus was not invoked. Or you're going to have to pick Peter did not raise Dorcas in the name of Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. How did that work out? How did Peter raise Dorcas? I want to know in whose name did he raise her? Because isn't the one in Pentecostal position to get to that power? You have to invoke the name. Why? Yes, that's exactly what it is. One hundred eight. One hundred eight. Let's move on. Mr. Bernard again, 109, when there is cause to invoke God's name formally, such as at water baptism, which is both word and deed, this verse applies in a specific way, telling us to approach God in the name of the Lord Jesus, just as we pray to lay hands on the sick. Now, I figure raising a dead person would qualify. And cast out demons in the name of Jesus, so we should baptize in the name of Jesus. He says... Just like we do this, we have to do that. But we've got a problem in the pattern here, according to Mr. Weatherly. 110. Now, Mr. Bernard says, well, you know, <laughs> formal, you got the formal times, and then you got the informal times. And on the informal times, Colossians 3.17 doesn't mean you have to invoke the name of Jesus. But on the formal times, it does mean you have to invoke the name of Jesus. Who came up with this formal and informal anyway? I mean, exactly where did that come from? Did that come from the UPCI? Is that who determines what? Because the Bible says whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. You see, Mr. Bernard has baptism and healing and exorcism and prayer and all that under have to pronounce Jesus. But Mr. Weatherly, according to number, whatever that number was, that he answered tonight, he, he said, well, he's telling us you have to pronounce it at baptism, but you don't have to pronounce it when Dorcas was raised? Do you really want us to believe that the, the apostles, Peter raised Dorcas, and he raised Dorcas, and it wasn't in the name of Jesus? If he did, he violated Colossians 3.17. I don't know where in the world that power came from. 78. 78. If you look at these baptism passages... Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts 8, 16, Acts 10, 48, Acts 19, 5. In the name of Jesus is what the sinners were told to do. It's not about what the baptizer says or doesn't say. What were they told to do? Look at it. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 8, 16. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10, 48. He commanded them. Commanded the preacher? No, commanded them. Commanded them. 
And yes, we as gospel preachers baptize people for the remission of their sins, but this command was to them, that's to sinners. Same thing in Acts 19 and verse 5. You know, 79, repent. Boy, have you and I fussed with the Baptist about this one. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have a copulative of conjunction and which couples two verbs. The phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ, modifies both verbs, sustaining equal relation to both. Whatever in the name of Jesus means for baptism, it means for repentance. Does that mean somebody doesn't repent? Well, let's say, Jesus, must the baptize... Hey, it goes beyond that. It's not only that idea, but must the baptizer say, I repent you in the name of Jesus. I want... Acts 19.5, we've answered that one. Let's move on. Here's 19, please. Time, Sean. He is 19. And uh, my 87, please. Acts 22, 16. He said, call him. Open your Bible up over there. Turn over there. You would. He said, this idea of calling on the name of the Lord means a baptizer must say Jesus. Folks, that's not what calling on the name of the Lord means. And besides that, it's the sinner that's commanded to call on the name of the Lord. It's the sinner that calls on the name of the Lord. Not the baptizer. That's a condition of becoming a child of God. Now, Acts 22.16, the word calling is mentioned here. It is the nominative case. It's singular in number. It's Masculine and gender, etc. The participle form, the ing, ing, shows ongoing action and a relationship to baptism. And the middle voice indicates that this is something the subject, Saul or Paul, is commanded to do. Here's Paul. Arise. Who's to arise? The, the baptizers to arise? No, Paul's to arise and be baptized. Arise and be baptized. Washing away who? The preacher's sin? The baptized? No. The, the, the sinner sins. And call on the name of the Lord. And the preacher has to say Jesus. So we have arise, that goes to the sinner. We have baptized, that goes to the sinner. We have washing away sins, that goes to the sinner. But we get to calling on the name of the Lord. Which was, woo. Now we've got this formula that the baptizer had to say. That's not, that's not the meaning of at all. I want tell you what, I was looking for your chart. Hold my time. Your number what's time time? Time. Your number ten. I might have to go back to time this thing. There we are. There we are. This doesn't prove Mr. Weatherly's point. Look over here. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for as much as we have sworn both to us in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord is between me and thee and between my seed. Relationship, that's by the authority of. In the name of David. Does that mean David? Or does that mean by the authority of David? Move on to go to number 11. Go back. I guess I missed. Go, go back. I need I need the list on the uh, the Jeremiah passages. Can you give me that? I'm sorry, Jason. Yeah, five. I wrote it down. Here we are. Je- and I understand Mr. Weatherly's point. His point is because it says swears falsely. Swearing falsely must not be pleasing to God. Well, I agree that's not pleasing to God. But look at this. That's not the point. He's missing the point. This says, and you shall not swear falsely in my name, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I, I am the Lord, His person. The point in this is that sometimes people say they are speaking by the authority of Jesus Christ 
and they're lying about it, and he says, don't do that. I'm talking about just throwing his designation out. You know, there's some folks that say they're teaching the truth, but they're teaching false doctrine. There's some people that say they have some kind of special anointing of God, but they don't. Maybe they've deceived themselves about it. Look here, Jeremiah 14, 14. The Lord, these are pretty good charts, by the way, from my standpoint. The Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not. They said God sent them. That's his point. It's not that they were running around saying, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. Jeremiah 29, 23. Because they have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken lying words in my name. They said, I'm teaching the truth. But they're not. This is by authority, Mr. Weather. What do you mean this isn't by authority? I love you, but this isn't going to cut it. Micah 4, 5. By the way, it doesn't really matter. Dr. Schill even admitted this is authority. Micah 4, 5. At least you're being consistent. I appreciate that. For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of our Lord. Walk around saying, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Jesus, 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 or is he saying, I'm walking by the authority of the Lord. I'm in covenant relationship with him. Zechariah 13, 3, For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. You're lying about saying that you're doing this by the authority of the Lord. You can go to the next one. Okay. I thought there were some others, but that must be it. Thank you. That just doesn't work. Now, some of these sources are being misused. Several of them are being misused. But you know what? The final authority is the Scripture. The final authority is the Scripture. And when you look at Acts 2.38 and all those passages in the name of the Lord, and then you look at Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That's by the authority of. Mr. Weatherly has said it doesn't mean by the authority of. I mean, do you realize the weighty burden that he has? He can't show the consistency he says that he can show. He's actually denying that in the name of means by the authority of, and it's clear that's the significance of the phrase. Why go to such lengths? You go to such lengths because this is tied to what we were talking about earlier in the week, and they feed off each other. And when one falls, the other falls. And we're halfway there. Now, I mean this in kindness, but I wouldn't be your friend if I didn't tell you this. These things that that are supposed to be proof just aren't. I care about your soul, but we have a proposition that Mr. Weller is affirming, and he says must. He says that if if the baptizer says, I baptize you in the name of Christ... Or I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which we see in Matthew 20 and 19, that you're still not saved. And that's why we're having this debate tonight, by the way. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. They, they would refuse to see things they should have seen, and yet they turned around and they were binding things that cannot be sustained from Scripture. That was Jesus' point in Matthew 15. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Now, He's going to have to show us this, this pattern. He's going to have to show us that what the... Now remember, yeah, I agree with all the in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, the question is, what does that mean? But he has to show where the preacher... Remember his proposition. Look at his proposition. It has to be orally invoked by the baptizer. By the baptizer. So if the baptizer doesn't do it, you do it all you can do. But if he doesn't do it, it's not in the name of Jesus? No. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're going to have to have more than what we've seen. Thank you.